okay uh, now we are going to look at uh, transducers uh, from the physical input point of view and compare uh, different transducers that we already learned and also learn uh, transducers uh, that are uh, not covered in the uh, normal course of action So, uh, we look at displacement, very simple. Um, so, displacement, let's say linear, x. So, uh, if you have, let's say, millimeter to uh, meters, uh, meters um, we already learned potentiometer resistive potentiometer uh, either the contact type or the non-contact type so we can measure this of course we have already seen the pros and cons uh, the, the problem is of course we have a resistance which uh, consumes at some amount of power and also when it is a contact type potentiometer it's quite simple but limited uh, operation or cycles of operation and uh, if i have non contact type i can uh, reduce the friction and hence increase the operational life of the uh, transducer uh, the uh, other one that we learned is lvdt uh, lvdt again can be a few centimeters to um, uh, few meters uh, can be uh, built so we know that we have three windings and a core that moves x the one problem with lvdt is uh, the output is uh, amplitude modulated so we have to use a carrier frequency uh, and hence uh, we have to demodulate amplitude demodulate whatever form of amplitude demodulation we use we need to use a low pass filter uh, hence dx by dt cannot be very large <coughs> uh, then uh, uh, we uh, talk about uh, distances beyond uh, 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 the after lvdt of course we also have capacitive sensors uh, in fact, if you buy a digital screw gauge or a digital vernier caliper, most probably it's capacitive sensor or LVDT or potentiometer, one of this. Uh, so this is uh, again for uh, linear displacement. Uh, uh, for small uh, displacements, we use the inverse characteristics of the capacitive sensor. For large displacements, we use the area, change in area. Uh, and uh, sometimes we also use uh, multiple uh, capacitors in parallel and we count the number of transitions and hence we can get uh, even though each capacitance uh, plate width is let's say one centimeter we can add uh, hundreds of centimeters like that and we can get a large capacitive uh, sensor the other thing that we have not learned so far uh, for displacement measurement we use as what is known as ultrasonics The ultrasonic transducer, as we know, uh, acoustic starts at 20 hertz. Of course, we, have, we can have even less than 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz is uh, what we can hear. Anything greater than 20 kilohertz is called ultrasonic. So, uh, we use a transmitter uh, receiver. Uh, and uh, we send a pulse of ultrasound this sound goes there and comes so if I look at in terms of uh, time uh, it will take some time to come back and uh, we have the uh, time difference as uh, uh, not here from here to here 
uh, we have uh, time t. I, I call it as uh, t received. <coughs> so sending it at time t1 uh, and receive it at t2, t received is t2 minus t1. Right? And of course, we know that uh, velocity of uh, acoustic wave uh, is distance travel. Let's assume this distance is uh, uh, d, so d by tr, right? Or we can measure d as is equal to velocity into tr. So if you know the velocity of uh, sound waves uh, and we measure this tr, uh, we can easily uh, find the displacement. This kind of transducers, uh, it's very easily available, 300 rupees, uh, you can buy for a few hundred meters measurement. Uh, but the one thing is that you need a reflecting surface to measure uh, the displacement. And also there is uh, quite a bit of error because velocity is anywhere between 325 to 335 meters per second uh, of the uh, that range depending upon the air quality right so if air is humid you have uh, more velocity if it is very dry you have less velocity so there is a small error in this measurement but you can always correct it if you know what is the air quality and what is the velocity and you can put back and this is also used uh, underwater <coughs> Uh, quite a bit. For example, uh, the depth sounder, you want to find out how deep uh, the ocean is. Uh, you can send a uh, ultrasonic wave in water. Water, it uh, travels at about 1500 meters per second, much, much faster than in air. And uh, <coughs> sometimes we also use this in uh, uh, <coughs> uh, checking whether uh, there are cracks and uh, most uh, importantly the ultrasound image uh, today where uh, you can see what is inside our body. Uh, I am fairly certain that uh, many of you would have seen an ultrasound sonogram right? and uh, today if uh, a woman is pregnant uh, this, uh, this has become a kind of indispensable uh, tool. Uh, to uh, ascertain whether the baby is all right or not. But as a displacement transducer, uh, for several hundred meters, uh, we can uh, use. And the same uh, method, that is knowing velocity and finding out T2 minus T1, can also be used uh, for measurement of large distances, maybe uh, hundreds or even millions of kilometers by using a laser. Instead of sending a sound wave, we send a laser and we can measure, let's say, distance between the earth and the moon. <coughs> now, uh, the, uh, uh, this is for normal to large distances. When the distances are small, small, that is micrometer, nanometer, we use only laser. So, uh, for example, we can use, if this is uh, moving by X or say micrometers or nanometers, uh, then we send a laser, a coherent uh, beam and the laser comes back and uh, if you put a detector here, we get uh, interference pattern and by measuring the amount of interference, uh, we can measure displacements. Uh, which are uh, in terms of fraction of wavelength of uh, the laser. Uh, for example, if I use a, a helium neon laser, uh, which is approximately 600 nanometers, so I can measure distances uh, in terms of nanometers very accurately. So this is also a, a method. Uh, now, in terms of uh, angle measurements, Right, uh, we can use the potentiometer. Of course, this also we have seen. Right, so we put an angle theta here, and as the theta varies, the resistance varies, and you can get the uh, output. Uh, it is 
uh, also possible uh, to uh, use uh, other uh, uh, methods. One uh, very popular method is the capacitive type of uh, uh, transducer. We call this as uh, inclinometer. The inclinometer is a very simple device. Uh, it's kind of a bubble with uh, four top plates. So if I cut across on this, there will be something like this, semicircular. And uh, what we do is, uh, this is one plate, this is other plate, this is one plate, this is other plate. So you have C1, <coughs> uh, C2, C3 and C4 and uh, this is the cross section. So you have uh, the uh, gap filled with a thick liquid with a bubble, air bubble. So if there is no angle of movement, so we have now, this is z direction. So this is we have x and y. If it uh, tilts in the x direction, of course the bubble uh, will become like this. So C2 and C3 will uh, uh, reduce and C1 and C4 will increase. If we tilt on this side, uh, the bubble can become like this. So C1 and C4 uh, would equally reduce and C2 and C3 would uh, increase. On the other hand, if it is in the uh, y direction, in this, in this direction y, then uh, we have the bubble going like this, right? And uh, if it is in this direction, the bubble will uh, move like this. So depending upon that C1, C2, C3, C4 will uh, this thing. So uh, once again, C1 minus C2 by C1 plus C2 uh, will uh, give us uh, X and uh, C3 minus C4 by C3 plus C4. Uh, similarly, we can take C1 minus C4 by C1 plus C4 and uh, C2 plus C, C2 minus C3 by C2 plus C3. So, with all these combinations, we can measure <coughs> theta x and theta y. Right? <coughs> so, this is a very famous uh, uh, sensor. You can buy them off the shelf. Uh, as I said, the name is called the uh, inclinometer. Uh, 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 then the next uh, measurement is velocity, displacement, the uh, velocity uh, measurement is uh, always done with a seismic sensor. <coughs> with the seismic sensor we get a and velocity is dA by dt <coughs> so we take the accelerometer and uh, say send it through a differentiator circuit we get the uh, velocity uh, measured. Uh, now comes the that's linear velocity. Uh, there is also another way of uh, measuring linear velocity today, which is quite uh, comfortable. I will talk about it a little later. Now we come to angular velocity. Right. So this is uh, radians per second or omega right angular speed of rotation so if uh, i have uh, right uh, uh, 
shaft that rotates <coughs> uh, we need to measure the rotational speed uh, or simply call the angular velocity uh, so one way that we can measure angular velocity we have done this is stachometer so the general tachometer is a DC generator uh, where the characteristics is uh, omega versus uh, output is uh, very linear for a DC generator. Uh, the only problem is of course uh, it takes certain amount of power from the uh, shaft and it also takes uh, there is a commutator and a brush uh, and hence uh, it has an operational life. Uh, most of you would have used this in the uh, machines lab. Uh, the tachometer, there is also an AC tachometer. Uh, here, uh, we, uh, this is not the uh, one that uh, is uh, used, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm using this to, uh, to show the principle. So what we do is we put a elliptic shaped rotor, right? So if I do this, I put a permanent magnet, north, south and I look at the flux phi, right? So if I look at the flux phi, uh, if the rotor is in vertical direction, of course I have maximum air gap, uh, then I have uh, minimum flux. Let's say uh, this is theta equal to zero. Then if uh, the piece rotates at 90 degrees, so there will be uniform air gap, right? The air gap now is small, so this is uh, 0 and this is 90 degrees and uh, the flux will be high, right? Of course, it will vary sinusoidally. Again, when it comes to 180 degrees, the flux will go to 0, uh, then it will go to. So, for each rotation, uh, I will have uh, flux going through maximum, coming back to 0, going through maximum and coming back to 0. So, if I look at one cycle will give me uh, one rotation. So, the number of cycles I have will give me the number of rotations uh, per second and I can get the omega, right? But there is one problem, of course, to, uh, I put a coil here, I get an induced EMF which is exactly like this. But there is one problem here because the permanent magnet uh, has a, an AC flux, uh, most of the time, the uh, permanent magnet uh, gets demagnetized because the AC flux goes through it. So, what if you buy today, what you will get is uh, something like this. I'm showing the whole piece. Of course, the rest is the same. I have a permanent magnet here, which is connected like this. Right. Now, we put the same long piece here. So, if I have the piece in this direction, of course, this flux, I call this as phi 1 will be maximum. So I call this as 1 and 1 dash. And uh, if on the other hand, uh, the piece is exactly 90 degrees, uh, 2 and 2 dash will be maximum. So if I now look at uh, the uh, fluxes, right? Um, so, uh, this flux, let's say, varies like this. Uh, and this flux will vary at 90 degrees. 
right? There will be a 90 degree phase shift. Uh, so the the advantage is if I add these two fluxes, if I add this anywhere, you can have a DC flux. So if I put here, this will be a DC flux, but this will be phi one. Uh, this is phi one, and this is phi two. This will be AC. So what we do is we put four windings, right, and uh, we connect. Uh, let's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, four is connected to five. One, two is connected to uh, seven, and uh, three is connected to uh, eight. So then I get all these voltages. <coughs> Add it, and I will get uh, uh, an output which is uh, proportional to the rotation. Here again, uh, one rotation uh, uh, gives me maximum flux. Again, maximum flux, right? So two cycles. Remember this. I, I'll get two cycles of uh, flux here. <coughs> here again, I measure the. Uh, frequency of the uh, uh, induced EMF, I get uh, RPM. Right? Uh, there is also another uh, method which is quite popular. So what we do is at the end of the shaft or on the shaft, we connect the tooth field right? and then <coughs> we put a proximity sensor. Right, <clears throat> so either we can put an uh, inductive proximity sensor or a <coughs> capacity bus proximity sensor. Here I will get right uh, pulses. <coughs> if I get give exactly six eats here, then if I just measure the frequency f directly gives RPM. Just uh, check for yourself uh, because if it goes through one cycles per second, I will get uh, 60 uh, pulses. So if it is one rotation per second, it is 60 RPM. So if I just simply count the number of pulses per second, if I have 60 teeth, uh, it gives me RPM. So this is uh, another <coughs> very popular method of uh, measuring uh, rotational speed and uh, uh, it's also possible uh, to use the most modern uh, technique uh, called the uh, global positioning uh, system. Uh, the global positioning system was uh, <clears throat> initially put by the US and of course we also have an Indian system. So we have, uh, this is our earth, uh, we have satellites uh, going around the earth, there are about 26 satellites, then let's say I have a particular point here. I want my x, y, z coordinate. <coughs> x is uh, latitude, y is longitude, and z is the height uh, I want to measure. Uh, then each satellite position, let's say I assume this is x1, y1, z1, this is x2, y2, z2, and say I have another satellite x3, y3, z3. Uh, then I assume that distance is d1 and this is d2 and this is d3. So d1 we know is square root of x1 minus x whole square plus y1 minus y whole square plus z1 
minus z whole square right <coughs> so but the problem is uh, I, I need to measure uh, d1 and i should know what is x1 y1 so these satellites transmit their position x1 y1 is at one and time uh, of that position tp so when i have uh, received that particular satellite position tr1 i have x y z and tr now as usual i know uh, tr minus tp right is the time into velocity of light v uh, gives me d so i can now get d1 d1 d2 d3 if i know exactly at what time uh, it has been uh, transmitted and at what time it has been received so if i know this so <clears throat> that is uh, one uh, reason uh, that all these uh, gps satellites have uh, atomic clock so their clock is uh, very perfect uh, but on the ground we can always adjust <coughs> the local clock and uh, the the uh, thing is for uh, uh, knowing the position x y z we need at least three satellites but uh, because there are 26 satellites roaming around the world you will always get uh, more than three satellites let's say you, you your receiver can receive four or five then what we can do is it's called differential gps we choose three satellites to <coughs> uh, measure and correct it using the other two right so we use the difference uh, between the uh, uh, different uh, reception from the satellites because we have more number of way, uh, measurements than unknowns right let's say if i have five satellites seen I have five uh, measurements, only three unknowns x, y, uh, z uh, are required. Right? Uh, it is also possible sometimes there is a land based reference point, and with that also we can measure our local position and correct it using uh, the satellite position, DG, uh, the uh, uh, differential GPS is there. Again, this is so, uh, even though it is quite complicated, the mathematics is complicated. The TV, the, the satellite reserve, reception is uh, quite complicated, uh, but all these things are made into single uh, application specific integrated circuit. So most of our uh, smartphones today have uh, this GPS receiver, which will tell us exactly where we are. So the position sensing on your uh, map, on your uh, cell phone is uh, basically uh, the uh, Geo position uh, system, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, once I uh, know uh, D1, uh, uh, X1, Y1, Z1, uh, X, Y, Z, sorry, let's say X, Y, Z at T1 x comma y comma z at t2 right time t1 and t2 <clears throat> once again i know the velocity right uh, in a particular direction so x1 minus x2 xt1 minus xt2 will give me velocity in the x direction y t1 minus t2 uh, will give me the velocity in uh, uh, y direction and z t1 z t2 so we can actually measure the velocities in x y z on the three uh, coordinates very easily uh, using the global uh, positioning system uh, so with this uh, we uh, have almost covered all possible methods of measurement of uh, uh, linear as well as uh, angular uh, displacement uh, let us uh, look at another variable in the next lecture thank you